Good evening, welcome to the Kingdom Living College. For those of you who are watching online rather than being here in person. Uh, tonight we're continuing lecture three of our current series, Meditating on the Word of God. And for those of the, you that don't know me, I'm Pastor Lauren and I've put my hand up to uh, teach tonight's lecture because it's something that I'm pretty excited about. <laughs> so let's just jump straight into it. Taking God's word from our minds into our hearts. If you haven't had a chance to look at the notes from lecture two, I would really encourage you to watch that lecture online and download the notes because on the second page of that we had a diagram that shows the process that happens as you meditate on the word. You, you hear the word or you read it um, it goes into your mind, the Holy Spirit gives you, um, illuminates that word to you and gives you understanding. And as you have it in your mind and as you think about it, it, it takes root in your heart. And then once it's in your heart, the Holy Spirit can bring it back to your remembrance when you need it to. So that, that was a really clear diagram last week. And I'm going to be building on what Pastor Angel was teaching from that diagram. So if you haven't seen it, or if you haven't seen the notes, I'd really encourage you to go over it and take the time to um, read the scriptures for yourself and, and really chew on them, seeing as that's what we're teaching in this series at the moment. So taking God's word from our minds into our hearts. Let's look at James 1, 21, and we're reading from the Woos translation. <coughs> it says, Wherefore, having put away every moral uncleanness and vulgarity and wickedness, which is abounding, in meekness receive the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. And we're going to unpack that second phrase. In meekness receive the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. James writes, in meekness or humility receive the implanted word. When you listen to a sermon or you read a verse of scripture, the word of God is not yet implanted in your heart. If we give the word of God only a cursory glance or just kind of listen to a sermon on Sunday and then shoot off into our week, it is probably not even embedded in our minds. It's kind of just in one ear and out the other or you just look at it and then you totally forget what you've seen. <coughs> so we need to study and give attention to it, even memorise it, memorise the word of God for it to become part of our thinking. And once it's in our minds, we then need to chew on it or meditate on it for it to become implanted into our hearts, which is what that diagram was explaining so well last week. So it has been said that memorizing scripture gets the word into our minds while meditating on it moves it from our heads into our hearts. <coughs> and as we see in this verse in uh, James 1.21, it's the implanted word, the implanted word. So the word that we've, we've chewed on and we've thought about and we've really um, pondered deeply um, and allowed to, to sink into our hearts. It's the implanted word in our hearts that has the power to safeguard and bring whole um, healing and wholeness to our souls. James writes, receive the implanted word which is able to save or sozo, your souls. So that Greek word sozo means to save, keep sound, keep safe and sound. And for those of you um, who don't know, it contains within it the concepts of healing, preservation, so preserving your soul, protecting it, wholeness, peace and safety. It's so much more than just salvation as we see in the English. So what that verse is saying, is that when you receive the, Im, the, the word with humility and you implant it into your, your heart, it has the power to protect, to safeguard, to bring healing and wholeness, to bring peace to your soul. So every word of God that we implant in our hearts will be, bring supernatural healing, preservation, wholeness and peace to our souls. Never forget the whole what time that we're doing this lecture series, just never forget that the word of God is supernatural. It's not just a book. It's not just something you display on your coffee table. It's supernatural. It's living and active, Hebrews says. So when you invest time and effort into studying the word 
and implanting it into our hearts, it'll produce supernatural fruit in our lives. David wrote in Psalm 119 verse 11, speaking to God, he wrote, Your word have I laid up, other translations say hidden or treasured, your word have I laid up in my heart that I might not sin against you. I, I learned that as a little kid and, and the way that I memorized it was, your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. And so I knew at an early age that it, when you implant that word in your heart, when you hide it in your heart and you guard it there, it, um, it, it empowers you to know God's will for your life. It empowers you to have victory over sin. It, it's a supernatural seed that you're implanting in your heart. It's a treasure. Da you know, other translations say your word have I treasured in my heart. So it's something that we have to esteem and treasure. And it, uh, really, if you think about it, it's a supernatural word that God spoke that has supernatural power and life that he's gifted us with. And so really it's a privilege and it's a blessing for us to be able to take the time to, to get it into our minds and, and implant it into our hearts. It's not, never think of it as just a task you have to do to tick some spiritual box to, to keep God happy. He's gifted you with treasures in the word. Every Scripture says that, that the whole of Scripture is profitable for teaching and training and correcting, training in righteousness and correcting. So everything that you find in Scripture is profitable for you, will bring you blessing, will grow you, will um, cause you to be, experience more of God's love and more of his character in your life. So it's a treasure and a privilege that we have to hide that in our hearts. It's not just something we do to be goody goody Christians or to get God to love us or something. This, this, is, this is a privilege for us and it's supernatural. Just keep that in your minds. So a practical guide to meditating on scripture. <clears throat> and I, I felt it was important to really get into some practical stuff tonight because we've been teaching over the first couple of weeks about how important it is to meditate on the word. Um, the fruit that'll come of doing that but if it's something that's new to you sometimes I talk to people who've never really taken the time to do it before and don't know where to start and uh, not that there's a right way to do it but they just don't even know where to start so I thought it would be worth us actually looking at some practical um, tips and suggestions to kind of teach you and train you to become more um, intentional in the way that you dig into the word of God and, and the way that you study it. So unlike secular meditation that requires a person to empty their mind, meditating on scripture requires you to dig in and think deeply on God's truth, to think deeply on God's truth until his truths completely transform the way you think. Let me read that again. Meditating on scripture requires you to dig in and think deeply on God's truth until his truths completely transform the way you think. So to meditate is to reflect on, to ponder, to mull over, to talk about, to reread, to rehear, to say to others and to hear from the lips of others. And I have to say in our culture and in our time, as people, we've become lazy um, in how we think. Everything's kind of instant information and you can just Google this and get answers and, and um, you don't really have to think for yourself in our culture if you don't want to because everyone else has done the thinking for you and Google just tells you the answer, whether that answer is right or not. Um, so we've become, we, we can become quite lazy in the way that we interact with the word and so then we're not gleaning all the truths that God's hidden there for us because we're not, we've, we've lost the skill of really focusing and giving attention to and putting our minds onto and visualising like, you know, David would and like people in, um, you know, in countries where we don't have five Bibles per person in three different translations, in countries where they have one Bible per household or they've just got a scrap because they're in a communist country and it's been taken away from them, they are far more diligent and intentional and focused in their study because they want to remember it for all their worth because they need it and because it's life to them. And so um, I think the challenge for us as Western Christians is learning to think deeply, is learning to, to really focus and put our minds and our hearts into it and, um, 
in the midst of this kind of instant, easy, no pressure required culture that we live in. And I want to read to you, so Deuteronomy 6, uh, 5 to 9, but I'll just read verses 6 to 9. So this is Old Testament, this is God speaking to his people and obviously we're under grace, um, the Old Covenant doesn't apply to us, but in these verses you see God's heart for his people and you see how, how much he wanted his word to be in the forefront of their minds and to be just in everything they kind of did in a day in the way they interact. So he says in Deuteronomy 6, verses 6 to 9, These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. Thus shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house. So when you're together as a family having a meal or whatever. Um, and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. So when you're walking, when you're lying down, when you're rising, the picture is, you know, throughout your whole day, be, be talking about, be chewing on the word of God. He says, when you lie down and when you rise up, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they, sh they shall be as frontals on your forehead. In other words, keep them where you can see them, keep them in the forefront of your mind, keep chewing on it. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So God's saying... I want this to be the forefront of your minds it, because it's supernatural and because it's the, it's, the, um, it's the source of life and it's the source of healing and protection and growth for our souls. Yeah, so he's saying, talk about it, tell it, you know, like that sentence says, to meditate is to reflect on, to ponder, to mull over, to talk about, to reread. You know, you're, you're chatting with a Christian friend, you're, you're catching up for coffee and... It's as simple as, oh my goodness, like I've just been reading this lately and God really blessed me with what he was helping me to understand. And so, you know, it's l let it be alive to rehear, to say to others, to hear from the lips of others. Remember, our goal is to replace our natural, unspiritual and carnal thinking with God's thoughts in order to gain new insights into God and his nature and into who he wants us to be and how he calls us to live and to act as believers. So meditate on, on God's word according to your needs. Note anything scripture points out that is not true in your life and purpose with the Lord, with Jesus, to chew on it until it becomes part of your life. So if we turn over to page six, so here's some practical suggestions to get you started. Now, before we get into this, I mean, I'm going to say it in the notes, but before we get into it, these are suggestions. They're not commands or laws. They're some just suggestions just to kind of get you going or get you started if this is new to you. So Psalm 1, 2, David wrote, speaking, uh, but his delight and desire are in the law of the Lord or in the word of God and on his law, the precepts, the instructions, the teachings of God, he habitually meditates, that is, ponders and studies, by day and by night. So in other words, he meditates on the word as a way of life. It says habitually meditates. So it's just his way of life to be chewing on the word constantly, to be pondering it, to be uh, replacing his thoughts with God's thoughts. And that's God's heart for all of us. So there is not one formula for meditating on the Word of God. When you meditate, what you meditate on and how you do it will depend on your needs and your personality. In fact, just as a good example, if you were to ask um, Pastor Anjul or myself how we meditate on the Word and what our, what our um, kind of habits are, we're such different personalities that we have different ways of chewing on the word. Now we're both, both of us are really attending to it, giving our heart and our focus to it. It's alive to us. We know that it's God speaking to us, but the, the methods that we use or the way that we kind of, you know, choose or find the scriptures that we're, we're um, studying are different because we have different personalities. So that's okay. What matters most is not what, how you do it, but that you actually do it. So here are some different ways we can meditate on the word. 
If you're new to this, you won't necessarily know what works best for you. So you might want to try a few of these as you're learning and growing. But keep in mind, and I've already said this, keep in mind that what matters most is that the word is alive to you. That it's alive to you. Because it... The word is Jesus, so it needs to be real to you. It needs to be alive. So cultivate a sense of expectation that the Holy Spirit will give you understanding and will speak to you through the word. So when I sit down to spend time with God, I'm not opening the book like it's just a novel that I'm reading like any other book I might read. I'm opening it knowing this is my Heavenly Father's love letters to me. This is These are His words to me. He has something that he wants to challenge me about or teach me or something more he wants me to learn about his character or his heart or, um, you know, a promise he wants me to fix my heart on in the midst of a challenge I'm going through and he's going to speak because his words, it's alive and it's active, it says in Hebrews. So, yeah, cultivate a sense of expectation. So pray and thank him for that before you start. Father, thank you that your word's alive. Thank you that you're going to speak to me now as I read. Thank you that your Holy Spirit will help me to understand what I'm reading. And I often say, God, will you speak to me into area of my life? Because my heart's open and I want to hear what you have to say to me. So cultivate a sense of expectation that the Holy Spirit will give you understanding and speak to you through the word. And what that does as well is if you understand that it's the Holy Spirit, that it's God who needs to give you understanding and and give you illumination of what he said, you're not going to come to it in the flesh with your own intellect and in your own intellect try and understand and interpret it in the flesh, which sometimes we can do because we think we're smart and we think we know what God's trying to say in a passage. So by by having that sense of expectation that this Holy Spirit that's going to illuminate it to you and he's going to teach you and speak to you, straight away you're dependent on him and you're relying on him to make the word alive to you. You're not trying to um, figure it all out for yourself and put impose your opinions of what God's saying onto the passage. You're letting God show you what he's saying. Um, so here's some of those suggestions. So number one, you could choose a topic that's related to a specific personal need or challenge that you're facing and find as many verses as you can relating to that one topic and then study them. I remember the first time that I ever did this, I never knew you could even do this. Sounds simple or obvious maybe to you, but I didn't realise you could study the word like this. I thought you just kind of had to read it cover to cover. And the first time I ever did this, I was a 17 year old on a missions trip and I was just desperately longing on that missions trip to be more like Jesus and to see evidence of the fruit of of him in my heart, my life. But I was incredibly frustrated because all I saw was my failures and um, my mistakes and I couldn't see any evidence of of his fruit in my life. And um, I was sharing that frustration with one of my leaders. Now, I was 17. I I was sharing that frustration with one of my leaders and they said to me, why don't you do a word study on waiting? And I was like, what? What's a word study? And they said, just, just go to scripture and find, use a, use a um, you know, a, what do you call it? Not a concordance, a concordance, yeah? Use a concordance to find every single verse you can find in scripture where God speaks about waiting, waiting on God or waiting and study every single one of those verses and see what God teaches you about waiting through that. And I tell you to this day, the truths that God taught me, the verses that he made alive to me on that topic of waiting when I was 17, I've never forgotten. Um, Like some of them are still to this day really special verses to me. His promises were uh, still so alive from that time as a 17 year old because it was a a situation that I was going through where I needed to learn what God would have me learn on an issue that was relevant to me at that time. And so he really brought the word alive to me. And I saw, I mean, I was just a 17 year old kid, but there was one particular verse. The Holy Spirit just, it was like he shone all these lights on it and gave me um, spiritual just illumination and understanding about exactly what God was expressing in that it was from the Proverbs in that verse and it just lit up to me and it was so obvious because God had helped me to understand it it was so obvious that verse that I just thought I didn't realize it was the Holy Spirit and I just thought that verse was 
plain as day to anybody. And so I went to the leader that had suggested I do this word study and I was like, thank you so much for suggesting this. This has been incredible. And, and they were um, in another area. They were also wanting to learn more about just waiting on God and trusting God. And so I shared with them this verse that I thought was just very obvious. And they came back to me and this was someone that was more than 10 years older than me. They came back to me and they said, um, what does it mean? <laughs> I don't really understand what this has to do with waiting on God. And so then I had to share with them what the Holy Spirit had shown me because he brought it alive and he taught me spiritual truths. So, and I was just a kid. So any of you, when, when your heart, when you're expecting the Holy Spirit to teach you, when you're hungry and um, just eager to hear God's, God's heart for you, he makes it alive and he impresses it on your heart and he plants it there so that you don't lose it, you don't forget it. So that's just one suggestion. I told you I get excited about this topic. <laughs> um, the second one, so number two, use the same passage of the Bible for your reading every day for a week and soak yourself in it. So just, I have to say, there's been times where a verse has really touched my heart or struck me so much that not, I. I haven't done this because I felt like I had to or because it was a suggestion on a, on a piece of paper, but I've literally just sat with that one verse for a whole week or, or two weeks mulling on it, praying about it, getting it into my thinking because it was so pertinent to what I needed to hear or so, um, you know, contrary to the wrong thinking that I'd had. So I, I would really encourage you to, to do this. Don't, sometimes there, I, there is more blessing and more fruit and more power in just meditating on one or two words or a tiny little phrase than trying to get a whole passage into your heads. So that's another suggestion. Um, and here are some questions that you might, you don't have to, but if you're stuck or, don't, or aren't sure how to get started, that you might ask yourself as you think deeply about the scripture that you're meditating on. So what does this passage mean? You know, um, what, what, what am I observing here? What, does, what does this mean? What, what is God saying? What can I be thankful for? Now, that's not necessarily an obvious one. Sometimes the verses that talk about, you know, God's promises to us and his fulfillment of those promises and our identity in Christ, they're easy to just be thankful for what God's expressing and for his heart. But sometimes the what can I be thankful for is, you know, it, it might be a passage on the blessing and the fruit that Jesus brings when we're persecuted for his namesake or when we're going through a trial or, you know, it might be a passage where God is really just in love, gently rebuking or challenging or convicting you of righteousness, like challenging you and, and you can be thankful that you have a father who disciplines you in love and who was growing you and he was chipping away the rough bits to make you more like his son. So it doesn't just have to be gratitude or thankfulness for the good or the easy things. It can be, you know, um, gratitude and thankfulness for, for the tough things that he's doing because he loves us. So next question, what does this verse reveal about God's heart for me or his desires for me? That's a huge one. So that's one that, uh, particularly when you're reading through the New Testament, what is, what is this verse that I'm reading teach me about God's heart for me or, or about God's desires for me? Um, next question, what does this verse tell me about the character of God? Every, For instance, anytime you're reading one of the promises of God where it says, you know, he shall or he will or God has done this, straight away that reveals an aspect of his character. What, what he promises to do is an indication of um, who he is because he wouldn't promise to do something he wasn't able to fulfil. So if he's promised to protect you, that, that reveals that he is a, part of his character is to, is th to be a protector or to be a provider, or to be a, you understand? So what does this verse tell me about the character of God? And what does this verse tell me about my new identity in Christ? This is a massive one. 
If you just asked, if you were, for instance, just to make this practical as an example, if you were to read through, for instance, Romans chapter 6 or Romans chapter 8, and every verse, verse by verse, as you're reading through one of those chapters, say to yourself, what's God saying to me about my new identity in Christ through this passage? Or, or Ephesians chapter 1, what's God saying to me about my new identity in Christ as you're reading this? You would, you would probably get stuck on that one chapter for a month because there's so much in those chapters about our identity in Christ. And we, we need to know who we are. We need to know who, you know, everything that Jesus has given us and, and the, the inheritance that we have through him. In fact, we were reading, was it in lecture two? Lecture two, we were looking at Romans 12 where it says, um, be transformed by the renewing of your mind or um, let your outward expression be um, consistent with who you are in your inner being through the Holy Spirit. Well, how can my outward expression be consistent with who I am as a new creation in Christ if I don't know who I am as a new creation in Christ? So that, that's a really, that question is gold to ask yourself as you're reading. And then the last one might not seem um, obvious, but so what does this verse tell me about people? And the reason I included that question is, I spent a lot of time reading the Proverbs in particular, but there are so many passages where God gives us wisdom about people and about discerning different traits that aren't necessarily godly or identifying, you know, what is a godly or a wise trait and what isn't. Um, particularly in the Proverbs, I'm often asking myself that question. What's God showing me about people in this verse? And so, you know, the whole way through the Proverbs, he'll describe the character traits, for instance, of a scoffer or a reviler or of a wise man or, you know, of the diligent. Um, and so I can learn and understand people better and therefore gain godly wisdom in terms of how to relate to people um, and the kinds of friends I want to have. For instance, if I'm learning from the Proverbs about the fruit of a scoffer, what a, what a scoffer um, looks like from God's perspective, um, or, or someone, uh, there's so many different personality types that the Proverbs go through, but let's just use the scoffer as an example. If I'm learning about that from the Proverbs, and then um, I see in my life that I have some people in my life that I'm allowing to influence me and I'm allowing to um, influence my thinking or influ influence my attitudes or my behaviour and scripture would define them, not me judging them, but scripture would define them as a scoffer, then I have to ask myself, is it wise for me to, to let that, allow that person to influence me? Should I have such a close relationship with them? So this question of what does this verse tell me about people, not only, it doesn't, I can learn more about God's heart for his people, but I can also learn wisdom and discernment in how I interact with people and in how I impact them or give them permission to impact me. So that, that's a really gold question as well. So... Um, so the third suggestion, number three, memorize a key verse from what you're reading and repeat it to yourself as often as you can each day. And I put in brackets here, you could even put the Bible verse to music and sing it to yourself to help you remember it. Now, if you have been in churches for a long time, you might have been around in the era of what they called scripture and song. And so back in the day, I'm showing my age now, but back in the day, there were a lot of choruses that we sang that were actually just verses, word for word scripture, put to music. And the brilliance of that is, as you're worshipping God and getting this verse into your mind and into your memory, you're memorising scripture. In fact, on a Sunday in the um, LifeGate Freedom Centre, we often sing, Bless the Lord O My Soul, and that is Psalm 103 to music. So every time we sing it, we are declaring and we're meditating on the word of God. So you could be going about your day and as you're driving somewhere, be singing that song to yourself and then start, you know, really kind of breaking down each line of that, bless the Lord of my soul and everything that's in me, bless his holy name. And, you know, and it goes through every benefit that he's brought to us through Jesus. And so as you're thinking about that song, you're meditating on and, and pondering, thinking deeply about scripture. So oftentimes... Um, this is something that really helps me to remember. So 
I won't give you any examples because my songs are not very good and they're a bit embarrassing, but um, they work for me and they help me get verses into my head. Um, so that one's been really helpful for me and maybe it will or won't work for you, but it's worth giving it a try. So number four, um, whenever you exercise or travel, meditate on the Bible verse that you've kind of chosen or that you're chewing on at the moment. Speak it aloud and share it with others. So that's just coming back to Deuteronomy 6 that we read, you know, just constantly having it in your mind, keeping it fresh there, sharing it with other people because as you're speaking it out, you're also hearing it again. So then that's reinforcing it to you. So number five, turn the words of the Bible verse into a prayer. This is a big one because when we pray the words of God, we own them and we therefore reinforce them in our hearts and our wills. So this is, this is a really key one. Sometimes people say, well, I don't know how to pray about this or I don't know how to pray about that. Find what God says about that situ- situation in the word and then h- use his word as your prayer. Because then A, you know you're praying a prayer that aligns with his will because he wrote it. But then B, it's reinforcing his will and it's reinforcing his truths to you. And then you're you're owning it as we wrote here and it's just reinforcing it in your heart. So that's a really powerful one. Uh, Speak number six, speak the verse or phrase aloud and intentionally emphasize different words or phrases by your tone in order to gain new revelations as you do so. I'm going to explain this one a bit more because it might sound confusing. So speak the verse or phrase aloud and intentionally emphasize different words or phrases in that verse by your tone in order to gain new insights or new revelations as you do. So just to give you an example of this, many years ago I heard a sermon from Romans 8.31 where the preacher actually did this in his sermon. He took a phrase from Romans 8.31 and he got the congregation word by word, there was just four words that he used, but he got the congregation to repeat after him as he emphasised each in turn, each of those four words and then unpacked the significance of each of those you know, specific words in terms of what God was saying. And the way that he did that really, um, it brought that verse alive to me and it taught me so much. And so I've kind of stolen that strategy or that technique since then. So if we look at the same verse that he shared, Romans 8.31. Romans 8.31. I'll read it in the Woos translation first, but then I'm going to go through it with you in a different translation. So Romans 8.31, it says, What then shall we say to these things? In view of the fact, so we're, we're about to look at a fact, okay? In view of the fact that God is on our behalf, who could be against us? All right, so if we look at this now in the... NASB translation, it says, what then shall we say to these things? If, but we know, we read in the worst, it says in view of the fact. So it's not a if, maybe he is, maybe he isn't, it's he is. So God is for us, who can be against us? So if we, if we take that phrase, God is for us, okay? Those four words, I want you to repeat it after me. God is for us. Okay, so it it would be as simple as you sitting at home with those four words and saying, okay, God is for us. So I'll personalise it. God is for me. So what does that mean? The God who created the heavens and the earth, the God who spoke and creation came into being, the God who protected supernaturally and provided for Israel the whole time they were going through the desert, the God who raised Jesus from the dead, that God is the God who is for me. So then it starts to, wow, like this is the God I'm talking about, a God who is powerful, a God who has provided everything I already need. Like, yes, so God is for me, not just Mickey Mouse is for me or, you know, my mum is because she's going to love me no matter what. God is for me with, with all of his power and all of his resources, with his infinite grace and his love towards me. God is for me. Okay, so the next part, God 
is for me, right? So all those times the enemy would get in your ear and say, you're not good enough, you messed it up, you don't deserve him to love you. This verse says, in view of the fact that God is for me. So in the midst of in the midst of the enemy trying to feed you those lines or other Christians trying to or people trying to criticize you or pull you down, God is for me. I don't care how I feel in my emotions. I don't care what this person's saying about me. I don't care the lies that the enemy's trying to feed me. The the word says God is for me. He says it, let it be. Yeah? So God is for me. God is for me irrespective of how I feel in my emotions. Next word, God is for me right? What's significant about that? He's not against me. His heart and his intentions are always goodness towards me, are always driven by love and by grace. He's for me. He's never going to abandon me. He's never going to reject me. He's for me. Yeah, so this is what meditating on the word can be like. This is just one way to do it. But the last one, God is for me. It says for us, but I'm personalizing it. God is for me. Like this is personal. He, this, this God who created the heavens and earth, the God who's provided everything, the God who absolutely is for me, irrespective of how I feel or how I've blown it in the past, who is always good in his attentions towards me, is for me, for little me. Like with all of my insecurities and weaknesses or whatever I'm still battling with, he's for me. Yeah, so this is how you meditate on the word. So that number six, speak the verse or phrase aloud and emphasize different words. Often that's how I, God blesses me with nuggets from his word is just there'll be one or two words that'll, that'll kind of jump out and you can spend so much time just putting your heart and your mind into what he's expressing in that one little word or what, that, or what I know from other scripture can build on that one little word like I did with some of the other examples I gave you. So... Um, Sorry, I'm getting really excited. (laughs) So number seven, take a verse that stands out to you or touches your heart and personalize it, which I was just starting to do for you with that one. So remember, the word of God is his love letters to you. And there is nothing more intimate or personal than a love letter written by your heavenly father and your savior just for you. Okay, so take a verse that stands out and personalize it. And I've gi- I wrote, I learnt this idea when I was, I would have been about 18 or 19 when I first discovered you could do this. And I, this was revolutionary for me. And I'm a bit of a nerd and I'm a girl. So I would write these verses on um, pieces of paper and I'd carry them around or stick them on my um, desk or whatever. But on the back, I would personalize it. So I'm just going to read a couple as an example of how you can do this. So um, when I was in when I was in school, I often um, no one ever wanted me on their sports team because I was uncoordinated. No one ever really wanted to be friends with me, or I went through some patches where you know people didn't want to be friends with me or didn't want to know me. Um, and so I had some issues with rejection. And so I, I came across Isaiah 43.1 where God says, I have called you by name and you are mine. So that's a verse that speaks straight to the heart of rejection if someone's feeling rejection. God's saying, I've called you by name and you're mine. So I know you because I know your name. I know you and you're mine. I, you know, I want you. I want relationship with you. And so when I personalized it, this is just me in the way that I write. I'm, don't copy. <laughs> but just to give you an example, I wrote on the back. So I'm writing this to my heart. I wrote, God, your heavenly father, sits you on his knee and says, every single time we play. Now, this was a game we used to play. Every single time we play Red Rover, Red Rover, <laughs> I will call out your name, Law. I will call out Red Rover, Red Rover, send Law and right over. And I'll always do this because I want you on my team every time we play. And so in the middle of me being at school and, you know, none of the kids wanting me on their sports group, I come across this verse and and God's saying to me, I want you. I want you on my team and I'm always going to want you on my team. So that's how I personalised it for that one. Another one, I battled with a lot of fear and intimidation and insecurity. And so in, as a 17-year-old, I came across Joshua 1.9 and so I wrote it out. Have not I commanded you? 
Be strong and have a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be dismayed. Don't be afraid, don't be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And on the back I wrote, every time I have to do something that puts me way outside my comfort zone, which was a lot of the time, God is right there beside me humming fear not in my ear. And that was a song we used to sing in church. Um, God, my heavenly father says, no matter where I ask you to go or what I ask you to do, I promise to be there, Lord. I'll be there protecting you, giving the words to say and reminding you of my presence. Yeah, so that's just a couple of examples of how to personalise. And, and so in my own kind of modern language, it, it really makes the word come alive and it, and it becomes that love letter that our father intended it to be. So that's another way that you can do it. Um, so we've got here, <coughs> let me read that again. Remember the word of God is his love letters to you and there is nothing more intimate or more personal than a love letter written by our Heavenly Father and Saviour just for us. So allow what you're reading and thinking to penetrate your heart and stabilise your emotions. And I guess for me, in my funny way, that was what I was doing with these things. I was letting it really go through to my heart and letting God really speak to the core of what was going on in my heart. So number eight, here's another final suggestion. So take the scripture into your will, drawing new conclusions and making new decisions and basing your actions upon it. So this is, it's not just you thinking about and pondering something. It's like, okay, what does this scripture tell me that God's desire is for me, for my life, for his plans for me? And what am I going to change in the way that I act or what am I going to change in the way that I think or the decisions I make um, as a consequence of what God's showing me from this scripture? So God is longing for you to know him more intimately and for you to experience and receive more of his love. The more you read his love letters to you and think deeply about what he's speaking to your heart, the more you'll experience his love and the wholeness and peace that comes as we humbly receive the implanted word. So I hope that's given you some ideas and blessed you and gotten you excited for this adventure you're on with God in his word and meditating on his word. Um, let's just pray to close. So Father, we just want to thank you so much for the what fact that you've, you've blessed us with your word. You've blessed us with these letters. You, you've um, blessed us with the opportunity to experience and to learn more about your character and your heart and your plans for us. And so I just praise you and I thank you that you have given us this supernatural thing, that your word is living and active. And I pray for each person listening to this lecture, Father, that you will increase our hunger and increase our desire and our, our longing for your word and our eagerness to, to hear from you and to meet with you. And I pray, Holy Spirit, as we study your word, that you'll bring it alive to us, that you'll help us to find ways to meditate on your word and to think deeply that work for us with how you've created us and that, um, yeah, you'll teach us and help us to grow in this area. So we just praise and we thank you for this lecture tonight. Amen. So thank you for joining us and I can't wait to be able to share with you next week. Bye for now.